Okay, let's get started. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Nice to see all of you. I'm Christopher Hawthorne, the architecture critic at the Los Angeles Times and the director of the third LA project here at Occidental. I'm also a professor of practice in the Urban Environmental Policy Department. Um, and for those of you, well, actually, let me take a quick show of hands. How many of you are at a third LA event for the first time? Okay, wow, wow. That's a much higher percentage than usual. So um, the series, which is now in its second year, this is actually the final event of our second year, is connected to a course, really grows out of a course that I teach in the UAP department. Um, and it's sort of a hybrid. Some weeks we're really doing a seminar style, a close reading of literature on Los Angeles. Some weeks we're out in the city on field trips. Uh, we did one recently to see uh, the LA River. And, and other weeks, this is the class. These events are the class. And this kind of discussion is, is, um, is part of the syllabus. So um, I want to, first of all, thank my students uh, for being flexible in this, in this hybrid class and also congratulate them on the uh, panel on homelessness, which they organized and ran entirely themselves, um, which was the second to last panel of the of the year, based on feedback I got from the students last year, uh, we decided to let them, this year's students, uh, pick a theme for one of the events and really run the whole program, which they did. And they picked a very timely and very fraught and very important issue. Um, and I think it was a productive conversation, I think, that it, um, has actually begun to generate some new discussion between City Hall and some of the activist groups that are working on housing. So I think it also had a really um, specific impact on the political dialogue around around homelessness and housing policy in the city. So I want to give, um, uh, and then also thank everybody at Oxy for uh, all of the help on this series and making it possible both of these years. Um, we've had uh, a handful of events off campus and then several events on campus and um, the support here has been tremendous. So I want to thank everybody who's involved from that point of view as well. So um, we, as I mentioned, have, have come to the final program in our, in our series. And we did a version of this one last week up at Spur in San Francisco. And some of the panelists you'll recognize. So about half the panel from San Francisco is with us down here. And then we have some new folks to talk about Los Angeles. Um, and it was really a pleasure to be up there and have what, I'll be curious to see if the conversation is, is a little different down here in, in uh, in content or in tone, um, the, these issues, because San Francisco is so small uh, as a city, these issues are, are really hotly contested. And not that they're, that's not the case in Los Angeles, but you really feel, even as I was just moving into San Francisco, um, the sense in which the, these questions um, are being debated on a, in some ways, a much more regular basis than they are down here. But they're certainly no less relevant in Southern California. So let me give you a sense of, um, I just want to frame some of these issues about the question of technology, particularly new digital sharing economy services and the shape of the city. Uh, and it's a conversation that I've been hoping to organize for quite a while because I think among architecture critics, among those of us who write about cities, we're just beginning to scratch the surface of what these changes mean. And for all of the pieces that we've all read about the politics of Uber, Airbnb, and how that's played out in cities like San Francisco, and Los Angeles to begin to think about the impact of these services on the physical shape of the built environment, how we think about how we move through, how we uh, design our cities. Uh, I think we're just at the early stages of that conversation. Bless you. So when I was coming up as an architecture critic, say 15 years ago or so, there was a lot of talk, a lot of speculation about how new digital technology might change architectural practice, might change the design of buildings and cities. And at that point, early on, uh, around 2000 or so, I think most of us were f speculating, thinking about how new technology, particularly new, newly powerful design software, would change how buildings looked. And that was really the focus of the conversation. Um, and that was true in some of the new architecture that was getting uh, a lot of attention, like the Selfridges in the UK by Future Systems, or in this uh, exhibition that Joe Rosa, the architecture curator, organized uh, at, at Carnegie in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, folds, blobs, and boxes. And when Paul Goldberger <clears throat> reviewed that show for The New Yorker, asked the question, or at least the uh, headline writer, what if Howard Rourke had used a Mac? Um, and again, that focus was really on the power of that software and how uh, the way that buildings look might change. And certainly, there is that strain still evident in 
contemporary architectural practice, if you think about the work that Patrick Schumacher is doing in Zaha Hadid's office, so-called parametric design, that's still very much part of the conversation. There's certainly an argument to be made that, that design software has really changed how buildings look. But what has changed much more dramatically, in fact, in those 15 years is how we look at buildings, how we look at cities, our perspective on uh, the built environment in a range of ways, starting with the literal perspective that is afforded by programs like Google Earth and how that makes architects think about, for example, the roof. I did a piece 10 years ago now on the top-down view and how that might change how we think about architecture and how architects and planners were beginning to have to think about the roof, the, uh, the fifth facade of buildings. Um, and it, that shift in perspective is certainly only accelerated with, um, with Instagram. And I don't know what the rankings are now, but for a while, uh, Los Angeles was the most Instagram photographed city I in the country, if not the world. And certainly, architectural landmarks are a significant part of that. Um, and that's certainly, I think, at the core of what has made the these companies, Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and the like, so revolutionary is just that they've offered a completely different change, a, a, a complete shift in perspective and how we think about the city and its capacity. They're not, of course, involved in building infrastructure. They're involved in uh, redefining how we think about the capacity of the city and where people might stay, where they might live, how they might get around the space that uh, is moving through the city unoccupied in uh, the back of a car or unoccupied in, in someone's apartment. Um, and, and, and certainly cities have begun to think about technology in something of the same way. Um, but it has really been those private companies to a large extent leading that change and that shift. Um, and again, as I said, that's meant that we look at architecture, we look at buildings in a much different way. So we look at One Wilshire and, and we think not about its late modern, sort of high modern corporate architecture this kind of super rationalist office building architecture, but we think about the fact that this is a kind of data center, a data hotel for <clears throat> data communications companies and is run by a landlord that at a certain point realized that they could make more money uh, renting it out to, to fill the building with cables than the law firms that had been in the building for many years when it was young. So that change in perspective and that sense, about, uh, that sense of the capability of the city um, even in projects that don't seem directly connected to technology begin, I think, um, to show some of the same shifts. And so if you think about a project like the High Line uh, in New York and its great influence, or even a smaller project like Sunset Triangle Plaza um, in Los Angeles, um, I think what connects the two projects is, and, and again, it flows in some ways from the lessons that we've learned from these new uh, uh, sharing economy companies is is the latent potential of the city. So not thinking about how to build a new piece of uh, infrastructure like the High Line, but how to look at the city in a different way so that we recognize the latent possibility of an aging um, or forgotten or disused piece of infrastructure like the High Line. Similarly, uh, with Sunset Triangle Plaza, uh, borrowed uh, borrowing, of course, um, directly from the work that Jeanette Sadekan, who was an earlier guest in the Third LA series this year, has done in New York, thinking about the parts of the city that are waiting to be redefined, um, repurposed, in this case, taking a small stretch of roadway and opening up it as a, a, as a public plaza. And that, that has certainly been, I think, one of the key uh, and most important lessons of Ciclovia is not just that it, it has been a way for bike culture to announce itself in the city, but it has allowed Angelinos to come together in, in a public space in a different way and shifted their perspective. And again, this idea of the latent possibility of the city, um, I think has been the important shift rather than what we can build or maybe alongside what we can build. And that was certainly the case for what I still think of as the most important event to happen in terms of how the city is used and how we think about it since I arrived, the immigration marches, immigration rights marches that filled Wilshire Boulevard and uh, Broadway, in this case downtown, almost exactly 10 years ago, beginning in March of 2006, which announced not only a really significant demographic change in the city, that this was now uh, right at the moment when LA County's population was becoming majority Latino, and of course the city population is just about to hit that benchmark, but also that that new demographic meant new, a new interest, new ways of, uh, an interest in new ways of using the city and moving through the city particularly to see those marches on Wilshire Boulevard, which is really the center, the place where car culture was 
born and perfected in Los Angeles to see that boulevard fil filled with uh, this kind of uh, uh, pedestrian crowd uh, was really significant. And when I wrote a piece um, on Harbor Boulevard, even in Orange County, some of these shifts are be beginning to be quite dramatic. Um, this was a, uh, this is a photograph of a protest that happened at the intersection of Harbor and Ball. So those of you who know Orange County, this is right across the freeway from Disneyland. And there were marchers protesting police shootings in Anaheim who were determined to march to Disneyland. And there were these, this police presence, um, mounted police who were determined to keep them from getting there. And what was really striking about this image for me is that, uh, this is in a, in a region, uh, part of the country that's really infamous for lacking traditional public squares and plazas uh, the, of the kind that fill more traditionally organized cities like New York or Chicago or even San Francisco for that matter. Uh, but what happened in the midst of this protest is that this huge wide intersection, which is designed of course to serve car culture um, at a huge scale, sort of opened up and revealed itself as a, as a, uh, a civic plaza where this kind of protest between the, uh, this kind of confrontation between the protesters and the police could uh, take place. And that um, connects to me to one, what is still one of my favorite images of Ciclovia, which suggests the same kind of latent public square in one of our intersections if we would just uh, begin to think about that space in a, different, in a different way. So again, it's not just about opening this up so bicyclists can move more easily through this intersection. It's also shifting our perspective so we can think about how we use that space in a different and perhaps more political way. So Again, the shift has been not in how buildings look, but how we look at buildings and the spaces of the city. And I think that idea of latent possibility in American urbanism is e even beginning to play out on a really dramatic scale that dwarfs, let's say, the scale of the High Line, which is only a couple of miles from end to end. This is the, an image of the Beltline project in Atlanta, which Allison Arieff, one of our panelists, has written about recently. Um, and it, like the High Line, uh, takes advantage, but at a much bigger scale, as I mentioned, takes advantage of a kind of latent, disused collection of railway right-of-ways that are now being stitched together into a, a loop, which will be uh, a green space and new transit uh, connections uh, and bike paths all around the kind of outskirts of the city. So taking this, instead of the Beltway idea of a, of a kind of freeway loop that we see in so many American cities, thinking of that as a place to uh, redefine mobility, transportation, how we think about public space and green space um, in the American city. And certainly that idea of latent possibility is I think at the heart of the potential of our efforts, ongoing efforts to remake and rethink the Los Angeles River. And of course the paradox of the river was that um, the attempt by the Army Corps of Engineers to wrap the entire thing in, in concrete was really in some ways, despite its ambition and the kind of muscular scope of that project, also um, had the byproduct of making this huge piece of infrastructure, this huge piece of the natural environment in Los Angeles disappear. And that was, of course, also because we added these fences along most of the length of the river and cut it off from public access. Um, and so I think a lot of the conversation that's happening now about with what the river's future is, and we did an event last year as part of this series, on the future of the river is uh, thinking about what a third LA river might look like if the first LA river was the wild one that flooded periodically and the second LA river was this one uh, in the concrete straitjacket. The third LA river is one that really takes advantage of that conversation about latent urbanism and thinks about um, how, to, uh, how to rediscover something that was sort of sitting in plain sight. And I think anyone, any of the advocates who've worked on the river would tell you that the first step in this process has been convincing most Angelinos that we in fact have a river running through the middle of the city. And the idea that it's 51 miles long and operates as a kind of spine, um, uh, the potential is really first to rediscover it and think about the number of uses it might play in addition to the flood control, which is of course the one and only priority of the Army Corps as it remade the river uh, in the middle decades of the 20th century. So I think that's the kind of frame that I was thinking of as we wanted to put the conversation together. Um, but there are a couple of twists, and I think those twists might help us, with the uh, assistance of the panelists, push the conversation a little bit further. And that twist is that um, as we're having a conversation about the infrastructure that, can, that has been forgotten about that might be reinvented, whether that's the High Line or the LA River, um, th at least in Southern California, this is still a region that is very much in the business of building transit infrastructure. And 
uh, Measure R, which will, will, a new version of which will be back on the ballot in November, may raise as much as 100 or $120 billion. Not all of that, of course, will go to new transit, but the lion's share of it will. It's a staggering kind of war chest when you think about how uh, transit agencies in most cities in the country around the world are struggling to raise uh, uh, monies to bring uh, their transit systems um, into the 21st century. And here we are thinking about uh, projects as ambitious and as long dreamed about as if you look at the, at the left side of that image, thinking about um, at long last building a transit connection through the Sepulveda Pass and perhaps a train tunnel beneath the 405. So we're in a region where the city is thinking about public infrastructure in an incredibly ambitious way that really matches the ambition of the, uh, of the ambition that made the freeways and, and, and concretized the river. And then the other part of that twist is that, uh, is that technology companies themselves, despite having really remade cities so far by, by thinking of that latent uh, potential um, in the American city are now moving quickly into the construction of infrastructure and, and physically reshaping cities themselves. So whether that's Elon Musk and Hyperloop, uh, which will soon be um, uh, testing itself out on a test track in Nevada, and I think Allison is gonna go see that, so we'll wait to read her piece about it um, next month, is that right? Um, or perhaps more to the point whether that's the Google um, spin-off uh, Sidewalk Labs, which is really in just in the last few weeks really been leaking out some very minor details about uh, the potential of building a new kind of model city. Uh, there's the potential both in public, public and private realm of new kinds of infrastructure and a new kind of uh, ambition about remaking the physical spaces of the city and not just remaking how we, our perspective on the city and think and are thinking about how we, um, how we move through it. So I'll just leave you the, with this image to think about uh, a couple different generations of, of infrastructural ambition, let's say, uh, public and private. Um, so we have a really fantastic panel uh, to discuss these issues. It's also a big panel, so we're going to hear from a lot of voices. I thought this topic was big enough that we really wanted to try to hear it addressed from a number of different perspectives. So let me invite the panelists to, to join me, and I'll introduce them as they come. And then I'll join them um, seated as well. Um, we don't have name tags as we had last time. So, Al okay, Allison, who's at the far end. Allison Arieff is editorial director of SPUR, the San Francisco planning nonprofit where we had the conversation last week. Many of you also will know her work um, as a columnist for the New York Times uh, for a full decade now where she writes about architecture, design, and cities. Um, and is a contributor to a number of other publications um, writing about these issues. Um, and next to her is Emily uh, Castor from Lyft, who is, uh, where is Emily's bio? There it is. Um, uh, Director of Transportation Policy at, at Lyft, uh, who has really been charged in that position in thinking about this issue and how uh, Lyft deals with uh, uh, differing policy regulations um, and political climates, for that matter, in cities um, around the country. And she and Allison also both joined us um, last week. And next to her is Maria Bustios, an LA-based um, writer, critic, and journalist who I was interested in bringing onto the panel because, in part, because of the, some of the work she's been doing for the New Yorker website on um, taxi service and Uber in Los Angeles. I think that was the first piece of hers that made me think that she'd be a great voice to. Um, to add to the panel, so we're really glad that, that she's here. Uh, next to her, as I've mentioned, Ashley Hand is almost out of central casting, almost perfectly made for this conversation. Um, she, for the course of the year, has been serving as the transportation technology strategist for the City of Los Angeles Department of Transportation. She's appointed to that uh, post by Mayor, Mayor Eric Garcetti uh, last August. Uh, before that, she was Chief Innovation Officer for the City of Kansas City, which I'm curious to ask her about. Um, and also, before that, was an architectural designer and planner for the big uh, design firm AECOM. So really uh, brings a, a particularly well-suited um, bunch of experience and has been thinking about a lot of the issues that I just raised in this year. So I'm curious to um, hear her thoughts. Next to her is Matt Buchanan, who also joined us in San Francisco. Um, 
who was, uh, uh, for uh, many of you, you'll know his work for The All, where he was uh, co-editor with John Herman. He's now features editor at Eater, where he writes about coffee and other subjects. Um, and he's been doing some coffee uh, reconnaissance in Los Angeles and told me before we came out that he thinks that Los Angeles has the most interesting coffee scene in the country at the moment. I was very interested to hear that, so maybe we can get some recommendations. Um, um, and uh, finally, Tafari Bain, uh, who m some of you will know from his Instagram feed, some of you will know because um, he has been on the board of Ciclavia, and I think importantly for this conversation, help spearhead the expansion of Ciclavia into South Los Angeles. In 2014, he was appointed commissioner on the City of Los Angeles Transportation Commissioner. Um, he also has experience um, working on, on political activism, community engagement in a range of ways, and is also the founder of EMH Creative Group, a consulting firm uh, focused on strategic planning, communications, and production. So. It's a long, it's a mouthful of introductions, but I'm really grateful to all of our panelists. I'm gonna try to detach this microphone and, um, and, and join them, um, and we'll, we'll go from there. And I think we also wanna uh, make sure that we leave some, um, some time for questions and comments from, from all of you. So, um, Ashley, I, I wanna start with you, um, because as I mentioned, you've been thinking about these issues for what, eight or nine months now? Um, I want to just ask how you how, how this position came to be first of all um, how the mayor decided that it was something that he wanted to to do in, in DOT and then how you've spent that time how you've sort of framed the question of thinking about about these these issues which can be really politically fraught in a lot of American cities absolutely so I um, am privileged to serve the fellowship that's funded by the Gold Hirsch Foundation in partnership with the Mayor's Fund of Los Angeles and the idea was to not sit back and wait for the technology to happen to us as a city, but acknowledge that it's happening, it's evolving, and has great potential to really transform our urban environment and create a lot of benefits for people. But if we didn't have a seat at the table, if we weren't kind of structuring our policies and thinking about what the vision of the future would look like, integrating this technology and the solutions that it was offering into our decision making today, that we'd really miss out on the opportunity. So my scope is to provide policy recommendations and and pilot project ideas, and some programs uh, suggestions to look at shared mobility, so thinking about uh, transportation network companies such as Lyft and bike sharing, car sharing, and other public transit models, uh, as well as user experience, understanding that if we don't focus on providing a quality experience uh, across shared modes, we will really never be able to incentivize change in behavior. And then the third kind of major category that I have to look at, which is really uh, perhaps the most difficult because it's such a changing landscape, is uh, aut automated or autonomous vehicles, self-driving vehicles, and what the implications may be. And so trying to understand how from a land use perspective and from a regulatory perspective, we might be able to leverage the benefits in terms of safety and environment and um, potentially uh, access for, for people who are, are unable to drive themselves, really trying to leverage that out to the benefit of the city, trying to align with our goals towards Vision Zero, the sustainability plan, and the mobility plan. And I know you had a slightly broader purview in Kansas City, but can you compare the two cities and how they're thinking about these issues? One's a lot smaller, different demographically, certainly, but, but what were you able to bring from Kansas City that you've been working on here to LA, and, and how does the conversation sort of politically, civically differ in the two yeah. cities? Well, I think actually, so I was lucky enough, I was actually in Los Angeles before I went to Kansas City, so I m voted for Measure R and then let everyone else go pay for it while I moved to Kansas City for a few <laughs> years and have come back to see the benefits of that uh, uh, ballot initiative. But um, I was, so I was focused on uh, process improvement within City Hall, but also leveraging technology by developing a digital roadmap for the city. So trying to create a strategic vision as an organization that was looking at open data and how to make our data more accessible as a civic uh, and civil uh, institution and what that actually meant. Uh, looking at the digital divide in our city and understanding that with the arrival of Google Fiber and, and high-speed broadband that there was a, a major socioeconomic divide within our city that had to be reconciled, whether it was 
was creating pathways into understanding and integrating technology in your home, in your, edu in your education, or uh, at work, what the opportunity might be, and how do we create those spaces for our community. Um, and then ultimately, how do we leverage the, the tech workforce within our city and create a, a smart city? And so the, kind of the last big hurrah that I had when I was in Kansas City was I brokered a public-private partnership uh, to bring smart city infrastructure to a new streetcar starter line that's in downtown uh, Kansas City. And it was a really unique opportunity because at one point they actually value engineered all of the conduit out of the project. So there was a moment in time where someone said this is a really cheap line item, we need to cut uh, uh, our costs a little bit, let's get rid of the technology overlay. And what we were able to do is demonstrate through kind of a learning process that had happened at City Hall around data driven decision making that to eliminate the potential of capturing more data to understand in real time how our infrastructure was serving our community and what type of quality of experience that was giving our, our citizens, we are missing out on a huge opportunity and we brought that back in. And so while the scale is radically different, uh, I think there's something to be said about the challenges that Los Angeles has to implement at scale some of the technology solutions that we see because while they're very affordable when you're talking about uh, a smaller city about 466,000 people in a metro region of about 2 million, uh, while the landmass was great, we certainly didn't have the struggle of kind of scaling up to that, uh, to the scale of, of Los Angeles. So it's certainly a lot of that. But I do have to say that there's one thing that's a common thread between the two cities, and that was visionary leadership that understood the value of partnership, of new ways of doing business, of data-driven decision making, and how technology can actually help free up resources to focus on some of the greatest problems that we have elsewhere, because you find efficiency by lever leveraging that technology. Can and that was something that I think uh, both Mayor Garcetti and Mayor James were willing to embrace. Could I sneak in with yeah, a little sure, question? Sure, sure. Um, to what extent in your work uh, do you consider the limitations that uh, the big tech companies bring to this kind of reasoning? I mean, there was a really good piece just for example that I was talking about with Chris yesterday that had really had a big effect on me that Evgeny Morozov wrote about mapping mm -hmm. and the limitations that mapping would bring to individual people because if, if it behooves Google to show you certain restaurants and not other restaurants, you're only going to see the city through the window that, that Google would like. Yeah. So to what extent does that enter into your work? Uh, I think uh, daily, and I actually would say it comes both ways. I think government also has a limited lens to, with which we, you know, can make assumptions or decisions. So when we think about, you know, uh, modeling, or if we think about our traffic management center, we have a we have a very rigorous data collection system where we understand kind of the volume and flow through on our roadways, as an example. So when we, we partnered with Google Waze, as an example, where they were willing to share crowdsource information about what was happening on our right-of-way, well, there was a little bit of a culture tension there about whether or not crowdsource data would be more rigorous than what we had to offer from our hardwired system. And so there's a culture change that has to occur on both sides. And I think that's one of the key things that I've discovered in the last few years of work is that if government and the community are not at the table and having the conversations to identify a shared vision, we have uh, different metrics for success. And so we will never quite get there together if we're not working together throughout the partnership. And I think that's something that we saw when I was working with Cisco that kind of knew what the solution was, uh, worked with us to identify priority areas. But when it came down to it, the types of kind of priorities that we had as city government were always going to be different. And so we, uh, have to be able to uh, have a voice at, at the, in the conversation and start it early um, and have to be advocates. But we also have to think differently about how we approach technology. So sometimes the large uh, technology solution isn't the best. And I think we saw that with the recent news in Washington, D.C. that after $23 million invested in a pilot project, they're walking away from something. And so being more agile and willing to test things at a smaller scale and, and be willing to fail is something that government's not very good at, but I think there's a move across local governments in particular to change. And let me, yeah, that's a really great question, Maria, and let me actually ask each of you in turn on the panel, I think a little more choreography is, is necessary than typical with the panel this, of this size, and starting with Allison, just to ask if you had advice for Ashley or cities that are grappling with this, what are the themes from each of your different points of view? 
Um, what oh, advice sorry. would you give her? Not what are the things that, that a, a position like this, somebody thinking about this issue shouldn't, shouldn't forget about or shouldn't overlook? Well, one, even what you've articulated in the last few minutes, I think I'm, I'm not going to have a lot of advice to give you that you don't already have. But I think the point about uh, different entities having different metrics is super important and something that you recognized. Um, and, you know, we started doing a series of panels at Spur last year on uh, what tech can learn from urbanists and vice versa, because I do think those entities come to the table with such different concerns. Um, one of my huge issues around the smart city movement is it is so much about a company like Cisco selling their giant package. And I see that it, the, the idea that you could just buy something to fix it is super appealing, but that needs to be taken with a huge grain of salt. And I think uh, I was, I guess, talking a bit about this to everyone in the room. I met with Genentech the other day for this corporate campus project that I'm working on, and we were talking about their corporate shuttles versus other company shuttles. And they've had shuttles for at least 20 years, and they have always said Genentech on the side, and they've always aligned themselves quite closely with local governments to discuss where the stops were, how many passengers were going, where the routes are, which is the direct opposite of what, say, Google has done. In, uh, a kind of stealth bus and, and wouldn't, wouldn't give out the number of stops, how many people were taking the buses, when the buses were leaving, and I think that um, basic transparency is the advice I give from both sides. Um, I think that no, one, no one's written an article about how much they hate Genentech shuttles. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, <laughs> Allison, no, it, may no be a me, it may be a measure of how differently these mm -hmm. issues play out in San Francisco versus LA that I actually don't even know whether Google runs shuttles for its employees in Southern California. Do you know if that's true? I don't even know if those are if these tech companies who are moving down here do that. It seems like I think it would, they may. I, they do have a number of employees here, but it, you know, certainly the industry does not dominate the city in the same and way. And it hasn't that, attracted that it the same. It certainly hasn't right. hasn't generated any controversy. The, 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 larger, yeah. the larger issue of like you can you can see the the city and the government as an enemy or an ally, and vice versa. And I think right now I'm still seeing a lot more of enemy <coughs> rather than ally, and I'd love to see that both, you know, it's not both, it's far more than two, like all sides saying like we have something to get from each other and let's see if we And that, that may also be a difference in the two regions because here we're in this limbo where we're still building out a comprehensive transit system and we still have a decade or two or more to go before we get there. And even when we get there, the spaces that we're trying to cover are so significant even compared to the whole regional um, transit infrastructure in the Bay Area that there are going to be gaps and I think there's a sense that um, that some the of these the companies can begin to fill that. <laughs> we can it say that. As I can say that as a mind. native too. Um, <laughs> and I said it last week too. I'm not afraid to say it up there as well. Um, so Emily, your perspective on some of these issues. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Ashley has taken an incredibly community driven approach, which is why, you know, I think I would anticipate that whatever strategy you come up with is it's not going to look like the perspective of, you know, one tech company offering, you know, a one size fits all solution. I've been to like numerous stakeholder meetings with different types of community groups from environmental groups and I know you've had dozens and if not hundreds of those conversations and I think that's really what it takes because we can't expect that these different entities that were created and exist for different purposes whether you know it's a company or it's a community organization or a government are gonna have the same goals right there they exist for different reasons um, but the citizenry that exists and uses um, all of those different entities Okay. I guess we're time <laughs> I'm back. <is> up. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's the same populace that needs to uh, participate in all of those different institutions. And so I think when we, we do come together and provide input from all of that, it takes a kind of a neutral broker to synthesize that, um, to bring it into the policy sphere, to have that dialogue, um, and to make sure that, that it creates a vision for, for how um, technology can be leveraged for public benefit. And certainly, you know, it's. It's been an interesting experience in San Francisco the last few years uh, to live through that kind of contention between the technology industry and, and the public sector. And, and for me um, to see and be involved in that around the country as we've seen the introduction of our industry into so many different cities where it has been very contentious in so many cases. But I think what's, what I've learned is that um, generally the intentions of the technologists that are building these products are to do something useful and to have a positive impact on people's lives. But in many cases, they're blind to externalities that 
um, they have not anticipated or don't or aren't aware of from their perspective. And so that's why it's it's always been Lyft's approach to try to come in with some level of humility and say, hey, look, we built this thing. We want it to be useful. We want it to to create a positive impact that um, that is valuable for people's lives and for communities writ large, um, but we want your feedback about what you think it's useful for and sort of what your objectives are as policymakers. Um, and, and that's really an interesting conversation. It's sort of asking instead of telling. Well, like the fact that you're here is already demonstrating a level of corporate citizenship that I think is altogether too rare in <laughs> Silicon Valley. On the other hand, you know, it's like I, I hear that phrase way too rarely. You know, there are these companies who come in and expect to be part of a community, and yet I don't see, like, a, a, they don't come in, come with all the humility you want, but be responsible. We owe something to this community that we're taking so much from. That kind of rhetoric is entirely absent, and it needs to come back. I think a lot of folks don't know how to start, right? Because the, the language of Silicon Valley is scalability. It's about the, the whole you know, sort of value philosophy of venture capital and technology is that you build something once and you can use it everywhere and you don't have to go talk to people about how it's going to work in different places because it's the same thing that, you know, the, the code extends and is equally use, uh, usable in any community. And it, that, it, it is blind to the fact that the way it will be used in each community is different. The way it will impact the, exist the local ecosystem will be different. And so, you know, while certainly Lyft is a software company that's offering a product that we, we do want to have scalability, we also believe in dialogue. And we also, you know, want to have that conversation. And, and that's why, you know, we prioritize local partnership and, and talking to, to governments about the way that we're working so that um, we can get feedback. And we can, you know, it doesn't mean we're always going to agree on how everything should be done. But I think when there's a basic baseline of uh, humility and dialogue and common understanding about sort of what the, the goals are of policy, there's a way to get there that doesn't just feel like it's, you know, shouting into a void where, where like the, you know, the Death Star isn't hearing you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Maria, thought or two for Ashley before we move down to well, I mean, what I'm, I guess I'm is the male end of the panel, <laughs> I just realized. Over to the men. Um, I'm saying the thing that I believe the most about this, which is that a sense of, of uh, Corporate citizenship is like very, very, very big into that in my own work and you know my own advocacy. I mean, at the risk of advocating too much for my own profession, I feel that the decline of humanities education has contributed hugely to this. You have like people. We talked about this a little bit. You know, the people who are making so many of these decisions in the software world are engineers who have never read anything but Ayn Rand and Hayek. You know, and <laughs> like. Those are not the people who should be deciding <laughs> on policies that are going to affect all our lives, you know, because they have no idea that there's other human beings or that they're on the same planet with them. The, the liberal okay. arts majors are going to save us all. That's, that's my comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good, really good set of themes to um, keep in mind. Uh, Matt. I don't know what the... Uh, Advice I would have, I would say that, or maybe perspective from New York too, if you want to offer some of that. Don't do another don't contentious place. Don't be like New York. Like if you look at, <laughs> well, if if you if you sort of look at like the way uh, the De Blasio administration has sort of grappled with uh, Uber in particular, it's uh, you know failure is not extreme enough of a word um, for some of the ways they've been sort of dealing with uh, uh, Uber, like when they proposed caps and were sort of promptly steamrolled in the course of an afternoon. Um, you know, not that the caps were a great idea in the way that they were, but um, I don't know. Just don't be better than New York. <laughs> so far. I, um, I don't know. There's so much good stuff in the conversation so far. Um, I, you know, from the perspective of, uh, you know, my work on Cyclovia, I think one of the things we've been looking at is looking at this idea of public space as a resource. Um, and what it means to sort of turn that back to people, to back to citizenship. Um, and then those interactions go all up the scale. We have, you know, Pepsi, Cola will have a, a, a plant right on our route versus a little mom and pop church and a little mom and pop store and somebody's house. And all these stakeholders, we want to try to figure out some balance to allow them all to utilize that space because we want them all to use their public space, which they don't typically think they can use. Um, and sort of shift the people's perspective about the street space, and then also their their adjoining yard, their adjoining their adjoining uh, parking lot, their adjoining front of their frontage of their store, or the adjoining vacant lot that nobody uses. And you know why isn't that underutilized? So this idea of really you know working with people and 
and shifting their perspective on resources that they have normal everyday access to, like Lyft and the vehicle and the car or Airbnb and, and the house, you know, these resources that you have access to, but having the technology that lets you shift how you can use that resource and how you might be able to share it or give other people access to it or express yourself or express your civic responsibility. Um, the idea of civic responsibility really rings for me. I, I've done a lot of work on community benefits agreements where you have a corporate developer wanting to build sort of a staple center, for example, and the government agencies and community sort of leadership imposing a level of civic responsibility on that development through a contract that provides concrete benefits. It could be money invested in housing or money invested in parks. Um, and that kind of contractual slash civic relationship between stakeholders and developers slash money interests, I think becomes something that's really important um, in terms of a tool to balance and, and get at issues of equity. Um, you know, it's, there's an old, old speech called the ballot or, ballot or the bullet that talks about the need to really legislate the change, the positive sort of progressive kind of community changes we want to see. When, when, and it's not necessarily progressive when you talk about equity. We're talking about just sort of a balanced playing field for folks from different levels of stakeholdership. I mean, this idea of an inclusive city is really important to me. And you know, when I think about Third LA, what I'm, our vision, my vision for that is this idea of inclu an inclusive city. And what does inclusive development mean? What does it mean to create platforms that all users can engage in and get either equal value out of, or equitable value even, which, which sometimes means you know the women's bathrooms are a little closer than the men's because they, you know, those bathrooms have always been in, in, unjust. So that so so you might need to go a little extra to make sure that you know we are in an equitable situation. Um, we have to, we have a we we're in a tense time. City the city of Los Angeles is at a different place than San Francisco or New York is, but we're seeing the same tension. I think the reason why you know the Google buses aren't being talked about much in LA right now, even though they probably do exist, is you do notice that most of the folks protesting those buses in San Francisco are housing rights advocates. <laughs> they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't really care about transit, really. They're, they're talking about housing issues. <laughs> and that's why they're barricading themselves to buses. Um, and so Where do you see that tension in LA? Where, what specific uh, issues and themes is it playing out around in, in Los Angeles? Well, you, you know, I'm, I, I think about uh, the story of a, a friend of mine I was talking to the other night. You know, I frequent some of Los Angeles bars. That's my Instagram would show. Um, and um, one of the security guards for one of the bars, you know, I always happen to talk to security guards. Maybe it's because I'm black. <laughs> and, and, and so I get to know one of the security guards for a while, and he's telling, like, he's like, this is my last week. I'm moving to Dallas. I'm like, why are you moving to Dallas? Why, in the hell, why would you move to Dallas? And he's like, well, you know, for, I can't afford to raise my family here right now. Um, otherwise, I got to move out to, like, I move out to the uh, Alhambra or something and try to drive in two hours, and that completely changes the nature of our relationships. I'm going to move to Dallas so I can raise the family I want. Most of my friends are having a story about, as they try to have kids, how they have to move out of the city core. Mm -hmm. um, that's really telling me something about the nature of what's going on in our city and who's, who are we serving. And for an institution like ours, like Ciclovia, where I'm, I just want to activate a street and have everybody play, the thought that a street will all of a sudden just be one thing, ethnic, class-wise. You know, it won't be an inclusive community where you will see the mom and pop working class family next door to the more well-to-do middle-income tech worker next to the teacher. Um, that scares me. And so this idea of an inclusive city, I think, become, it becomes a theme that I'm always thinking about no matter what work I'm touching. And I think that that issue of in inclusivity and equity is really, I mean, hugely important, but also tricky when you're talking about some of these services because some of them occupy kind of in between territory. So, for example, if you're talking about a perspective on public space or or the neighbor neighboring parcel or how you think about your own neighborhood, um, one of the big shifts in the transit investment in Los Angeles that I think we've already seen play out is that um, it's not just an investment in mobility; it also begins to produce a, con a new constituency that's paying attention to public space in a different way, right? Because if you're walking to the bus stop or you're walking to the train station, or um, there's usually a pedestrian trip at, at one or both ends of that trip on transit, right? Um, versus getting in your car in your garage and driving on the freeway in that sort of privatized bubble. F if you think about something like Uber or Lyft, it's a kind of in-between. You're a passenger, so you may have a different, um, a more sustained kind of attention to the landscape, but you're also moving on the freeway and you're not in a communal space the way you might be on a bus. Airbnb, which we probably won't talk about as much because we're kind of more transit-oriented panel tonight, the same thing. I mean, it can be a mechanism for taking housing out of the equation and clamping down on supply, and that's happening in places like Venice, and there's a lot of 
conversation about that, but it also, if it's used and if it's tweaked by cities in a particular way, it can be used to increase the flexibility of a housing stock, for example, um, and, and if it's used in connection with granny flats or a new kind yeah. of flexibility about accessory dwelling, it can actually do the opposite. So there's a kind of sense that this tweaking can be really crucial in terms of what the city's policy is. On I want to hear about Matt's yeah. experiences at local in Watts because it has so much to do with this whole thing about how the kinds of communities that people want to live in being inclusive and there being like a, a nascent um, a feeling of uh, just getting rich is not what people want anymore. Like I want to go to the rich, I want to go live at the Palisades and see nobody except for other people exactly like me. That is not what young people want now. People want to live in a okay. real place, right? <laughs> You do? You don't. I'm, you're not going to go live in the Palisades. <laughs> no, but I wouldn't mind being rich. Right? Like but if you were rich, where would you live? Like, say, in everywhere. LA. In L.A. Yeah. That's yeah. Right? Like, would mobility, you? like, the real, the real privilege of being rich these days is mobility. You don't have to live anywhere. You can live everywhere. Yeah. I just thought it was really interesting that, like, local, which is in a place that isn't necessarily the most desirable neighborhood but like is now having this really dynamic place restaurant that everyone wants to go to from all over town and it's community building too now i mean it's a, the whole different kind of set exactly. of ideas and goals for a business yeah like the I local really hiring like, piece oh, sorry go ahead but if the local hiring piece of it is really a crucial element i mean it's an embedded business you know it's it's, it's a business that also has partners who get who are partnered equally with the star element but they're like local people who've owned property and been in that community for decades. Um, and so that critical partnership of resource and wealth generation and also the staff and all that local hire, those folks are getting good jobs now. I mean, those are the kind of things that you talk about, you know, anti-displacement and like how do you bring in things that are kind of going to help build a community, inclusive community fabric. You know, it pushes the envelope. It's not easy. You know, they have ambassadors that work with them on staff to work with the community, local community to constantly make sure things are cool. I mean, just like the, any business has its people watching to make sure things are cool. I mean, you know, security guards at businesses. But the, the nexus of, um, let's say, inclusivity or exclusivity architecture and transportation is playing out in so many different ways. For example, the, I haven't gotten to this yet, but I'm working on a piece on the proposal to do a separate terminal uh, at LAX for the super high-end flyers who will have their own individual building. So it's not just a part of a, it's not just a part of the plane, it's not just a different ticket, a different class of travel, it's a different piece of architecture, a different piece of the city that connects you to LAX. And, and the, the, to, my, to me, the lack of debate over how appropriate that is or isn't for LAX to be doing has been surprising. But I wanted to get back to something, Ashley, that Emily brought up about. She talked about the city, if, I'm, if I heard you right, and correct me if I didn't, being a kind of neutral broker and bringing a lot of these ideas into one room where they can be hashed out. But given how fraught and how pressing some of these issues are, particularly around affordability and access, do you see, from your point of view, the city's role as being more active in saying this is what these companies will have to do, these are the targets they'll need to meet to, to help address some of those issues, or is it a more neutral role at this point? Well, I think, I think we have to be careful. As government, I don't think we should be in the business of picking winners in this space for the reason that we've seen that many of these services roll on and roll off as quickly as you can imagine and uh, relying on them to provide an essential service for many people uh, may be foolhardy. So picking that winner is, is definitely a concern. We have priorities, right? We have to manage safety, public safety, number one priority. Uh, and access and equity is certainly right up there with it because if we don't provide a safe ride, we don't have a safe ride for people, uh, it doesn't matter who's getting the ride at that point. So I think those are kind of the order of, of priority right now, but I would suggest that this, the role of the city is different because we have a couple challenges. One is our regulations are based on history and what we've known in the past and what we've seen. So we have this cumulative approach to developing policy. So we do a lot to enforce the status quo, even unintentionally. And so eliminating some of those barriers. Can you give an example of what, a couple of examples of that, how that plays out? Uh, well, I think TNCs and taxis are a great example. We had a, we had a, uh, uh, every city has a ton of regulations around taxis and didn't know what to do when Uber and Lyft started showing up in their markets. And there are, has been a considerable amount of work in that space to kind of look across uh, national best practices and try to create something that people can work from as a template. But we're still very early in that. Um, and, and parking in general, so single occupancy vehicles in general and the way we support commuter benefits and things like that, the very good examples of things that are kind of 
very structured and difficult to get through. Um, so I think the city has a role in trying to eliminate some of those barriers to new innovations by getting rid of s solely uh, uh, supporting one, mech one mode of, of transportation. And I think that's where things like the mobility plan and the sustainability plan and Vision Zero start to call out the need for greater balance across modes. So the pedestrian and the cyclist have just as much right to move through the city safely as do someone on a bus or someone who's driving their kids to school. Um, Maybe not a good example driving to school. We should be walking to school, but that's a whole other problem. Um, but I do right. think, I think there is a role of, of being a balancer, and so certainly that's something that we can, we can act as a mediator. And I think one of the critical things that's happening is a conversation around data. And data for the sake of data isn't good. So asking everything of the service providers that are operating on a private side and the public right of way isn't necessarily where we need to go, but we do need to start to get more specific in the types of data that will help us make a better decision around mobility and planning for the city at a macro level because we understand kind of the complexity of services that are available. And a question about that. Certainly a company like Uber has become really infamous for not sharing that data um, without singling out any particular com uh, companies. What has been your experience in terms of how much of that data is available, how forthcoming the various companies are, and, and how you're able to incorporate that into your planning? I, I would actually uh, suggest that cities are yet uh, not quite sophisticated enough to consume that data. And so until we are ready to understand how to build the mechanisms to analyze that data, and you see it here and there. So there's a lot of really great one-off examples of how, for instance, the city of Boston has created a, an office of data analytics at the direction of Mayor Walsh, where they can actually go in and really specifically look at very complex sets of data because they have data scientists on staff and I can tell you there aren't a lot of cities that employ that capacity in-house. Um, and so we have data within a City Hall that has yet to be fully tapped and leveraged effectively. And so there's work to be done there and understanding what the implications are around privacy and security, around uh, interoperability of systems and how we actually share and make that process of sharing data easier. So there's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done, but those conversations have started, which Yes. So shout, yeah. shout out Go to Waze. Shout out to Waze, though. I mean, the Waze, Waze uses in Los Angeles. I'm a Los Angeles driver. I know my routes really well. And I feel like when I use Waze, it actually teaches me something. So. <laughs> about the city. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Allison, so yeah, there have been Allison. some pretty intense discussions about sort of what the data sharing model should look like between services like Lyft and, and the public sector. And I think in the early phase, which we're, we're still kind of in the early phase, yes. but we're starting <laughs> to get into a more mature moment. And I think at first it was, you know, cities didn't know what to ask for, mm -hmm. or if they did, they were asking for everything. Yep. Um, and companies were afraid to share. And then there's, you know, there's also this sort of competitive dynamic that has nothing to do with the city, but everything to do with that if you hand data to the city, it becomes available possibly yeah. to competitors in the marketplace. Yeah. That, so all of that, I think, may, cre created a, a tense, um, discussion that was, you know, that didn't lead to a lot of data sharing. But mm -hmm. I've tried to be an evangelist within Lyft for finding kind of the overlap in the Venn diagram of things that it, it uh, isn't scary for us to share that's yep. still useful to the public sector, yep. right? On a voluntary basis, like going and saying, hey planners, what would you like to know about how people use Lyft? Because mm -hmm. it turns out actually most of what they want to know is where do they take Lyft? Um, how does that vary by time of day and day of week? Um, you know, what are the origin and destination patterns and the heat maps and what's the um, level of service variation across different geographical areas and, and socioeconomic groups? That's not sensitive for me to share. I've provided that data to, in aggregate form to SCAG and, and other entities that ask for it. What's scary is, you know, here's exactly how many rides we had last week so that yeah. our competitors can put in a Public Records Act request and track our, our progress and say, oh, we should redirect our marketing dollars over there. They're starting to do really well over there, mm -hmm. right? So th I think there's, um, there are different kinds of data sharing yep. and starting to get smart about where the, the overlap is, um, is, is the, the easiest way to start moving forward. Then I think as cities get more sophisticated about, you know, infrastructure to, to house data more confidentially in a way that can allow them to get more, more granular information, there's an opportunity to do that. But we definitely have to be good stewards, good stewards of the fact that we now have an enormous, enormous amount of information about individual travel behavior. And that it actually is incredibly revealing about people's patterns. And in fact, even if anonymized, if you know where someone lives, and we were just posting reams of anonymized origin and destination ride data, you could probably figure out 
you know, like when people were going to and from different homes. So I think, you know, we, we need to find a way to do this that's looking at the aggregate picture that's developed from, from our data and to share that, not to, to share, you know, specific information that's revealing of particular individuals. But there, there's totally a pathway through that, I think, that threads the needle and can be very valuable to the public sector. And I Allison, think that's I think Allison had a thought, sorry. Go so I've, I've long been obsessed with the whole notion of designing for behavior. And I think that something that, that fundamentally gets lost over and over again, I mean, you, you, you did make the point that, you know, a company wants to create the product and the algorithm that's going to work in all the cities and data is going to tell you certain things. But ultimately, people are super messy and stinky and, and quirky. And, and I think that all of the process of all the kind of processes that we're talking about still have not found a way to get at that. And it's, it's weird to read about like Sidewalk Lab's new initiative that may or may not be a city with no people in it to test stuff, or CITE, C-I-T-E, this plan to build a whole city in New Mexico to test all these technologies with no people in it. And the idea that, that you can see if any of these things are going to work without the, the quixotic nature of human behavior is just really a mess. And unfortunately, you know, I always think of the uh, Tony Shea, you know, the CEO of Zappos, who, who mandated a certain number of cultural collisions that his employees needed to walk outside like a, a few hours a day. You can't orchestrate that kind of stuff. You can't mandate that. Um, it's very much the school of, of Ed Glazer that, you know, th that human behaviors may be a little bit less important. But I don't know that anyone knows how to get at that. And it seems ultimately kind of the biggest problem. You know, I the smartest minds at Google couldn't have anticipated what would happen with the, with the shuttles. Like, no amount of data is going to explain why some days I decide to do one thing and the next day I decide to do the other thing, and there's no sort of rational yeah. basis to it. It's just how humans work. And there are but ethical, legal, I'm sorry, Marie, there are ethical and, and legal questions that we're only beginning to scratch the surface of. In fact, I want if maybe you can tell us about the moral crumple zone that we talked about last week, or Tim, you've sure. written about this piece about Tim, when do you want to talk about that? concept of the moral crumple zone, just as one example? Yeah, so we had a guy on our panel uh, last, week, last week, Tim Hang, who runs Bay Area Infrastructure Observatory, which I think they have a branch of down here, but also just got hired as head of uh, artificial intelligence for public policy for Google, and has been doing research on sort of all the algorithms and sort of behavioral data around all these services, and, and tells me this great story of explorations into moral crumple zone, which is the notion that if you are a passenger in a driverless car and the car is about to have an accident, what if the car then reverts control so that you are now the driver, um, giving you the legal, emotional, and economic liability for that accident? As just one, which is crazy, but just one of many scenarios <laughs> that you have to, I, I mean, I, I would love to be, and I'll get myself in there someday, in the room where people have to be like, okay, go. What are the million things that can happen that we're not anticipating? The cow and the bunny and the small child and like run in front of the car at the same time and what do you do because you can't you know and so we can't be perfect in it but I do think that there hasn't been enough thought I'm particularly concerned about this in the realm of the driverless car because I just don't think there's there's been enough real thoughtfulness about what that is actually going to mean for the pedestrian sort of human experience right let's talk about that a little and I'm curious about how the implications that has particularly for urbanism so what does it mean for parking infrastructure? Does it mean that we're suddenly going to have a giant surplus of parking in a city like LA? Well, we're still we already requiring, do. Right, we're still <laughs> requiring, yeah. thank you for saying that, where we're still requiring, we still have parking, um, parking minimums instead of parking maximums the way other saner cities do. Um, uh, how does drive, how does the, the discussion about autonomous vehicles and the, the particular impact on kind of urbanism and, and that kind of infrastructure, how's that playing out? And I'm curious how others think, but could I just like you. just interject one of thing? Of course. The idea that the idea that it's a problem that things are messy or that people like we can't make it perfect, you know, there's going to be all these things that are accidental and and messy. We want the mess, yeah, that, right? Yeah, I'm not saying that we don't. I'm just yeah, it's that critical. When you build a city, like when you build a city with no a fake city with yeah. no people in it to test these <laughs> things, you're not going to solve the problem yeah, because you've eliminated the actual. Isn't it fascinating yeah, yeah, though? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, this what is, a great this place is, to live. This is <laughs> <laughs> that's where you're going to live when you're rich. We this finally is got the, the answer yeah, to that that's question. That's where you're moving when you get rich. No. Yeah. I mean, oh, Matt, you're not that much of a misanthrope. You'll be lonely. Well, <laughs> and I think when it comes to autonomous vehicles and, and yep. thinking about what the effect on urban form is, there's a couple of, there's kind of the utopic version, which is 
it's shared, so you don't have to have a vehicle and, uh, and own a vehicle anymore, and therefore you're reducing the cost of your household, which it's the number two household expense, is transportation. So all of a sudden you're opening up a lot more disposable income for families uh, by providing access to vehicles that you don't have to own. You're also opening it up to markets of people that maybe never were able to drive a car on their own, whether because of a physical limitation or whatever reason. Um, so uh, suddenly you have a more accessible network. Um, and that, that could serve quite well uh, lower impact on our infrastructure because there are lighter cars and better for the environment, a whole slew of options. The other kind of opposite of that is the dystopic view, which all of a sudden you have cars that are driving around with nobody in them, so there's more vehicle miles traveled because all of a sudden your car can do your shopping for you while you go and sit in a coffee shop somewhere. It'll be a drone. It'll, It'll be a drone. drone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It it's attached wheels. and folded into four pieces. There's a whole slew of ideas that, and then you have satellite parking and huge sprawl because all of a sudden people don't mind sitting in a car for two hours to, to, to commute one way to work. And so I think when we think about uh, the potential, we have to start changing behavior first to improve the capacity of the roadways that we have already, which is putting more bodies in seats of the shared vehicles that we have. And does that mean asking for particular benchmarks, ask, asking these companies to have a certain percentage of their rides that are carpool, for example? Are you getting to that level, or is it more theoretical at this well, point? Well, I think because we're still lacking some of the uh, regulations at the state level, and there's proposals to develop a, a federal best practice policy to start, um, I, I think from the, the city level, what I think is the biggest opportunity is we do the demonstrations first from a public transit or shared mode starting point. And I think that's a great way to do it. You introduce it in a way that's somewhat controlled because I think the biggest risk we're going to have is that transition period where you have human drivers and robot drivers and nobody knows what the heck to do because they've never seen this before and there's a lot of awkward interactions on the roadway. So I think that we need a slow period of transition and inevitably it does. It takes time. People take a long time to get rid of their cars. They hold on to them forever and so to see a transition to a fully autonomous fleet is definitely a generation. Uh, but I do think that uh, in the short term, there's huge opportunities when we think about small fleets that could be used for first last mile connectivity to transit hubs. If you think about uh, micro transit as an option for lower density neighborhoods that might need some type of shuttle but wouldn't necessarily justify something like the dash bus, which is a fixed route, fixed schedule neighborhood circulator. So there's lots of different models that we should be exploring. And that's what we're trying, or at least I'm advocating for. Now, Matt, a question for you. You've written a little bit about, about Uber, for example, um, adopting some some kind of routes that begin to mimic mass transit, in fact. Lyft 2. Lyft 2. So tell Can't us a little bit about, about that piece and sort of what that, the trajectory of that, if you think about it in, in a, in, in a um, you know, if you begin to worry about where that could lead, what, what do cities look like if, if sure. companies are behaving that way? Um, so Uber started out, right, as the, uh, you push a button and a car appears, a black car appears, and it was, um, super expensive and mostly a way to be cool in San Francisco where like cabs sucked, transit sucks, whatever. Um, but as it's evolved, like, um, you know, like most startups, right, it, it goes from being perhaps like a niche use case to a mass use case because in order to grow exponentially, you need like exponential, yeah, it's like scale, right? Um, and so you've seen with Uber um, is that the, it's been getting cheaper, more people use it. Um, you know, more people use it, it gets cheaper, and uh, well, well, so a lot of the innovation that they're working on now will sort of eliminate surging, right? Because like, if you if you look at Uber, right, like the or or Lyft or whatever, right, um, the uh, you know they're moving. They've been slowly moving toward things that more and more closely resemble uh, mass transit with like fixed routes, uh, more people in cars, and there are a number of reasons to do that. Um, one is to mitigate things like surge pricing, so that way you have, um, you know, they've started this thing called an endless route, where like if you, I don't know if you've used Uber lately, but you might have seen like, your driver is completing a trip nearby. Um, and then so, uh, you know, the driver basically has like no break between, um, you know, when they drop off that passenger and, and when they pick you up, which theoretically is good for the driver because there's no downtime, so they're making money. It's also good for Uber because like, they're, they're meeting demand more efficiently, which means uh, less surge pricing, and you know when you don't have surge pricing, um, more people are more likely to use it. Um, and so, you know, and this is how you sort of transition over time to something where um, Uber becomes cheaper and cheaper because like, you know, now they're getting four people in cars, and like, um, 
and, and the routing becomes more efficient and uh, over time you sort of have something that looks more and more like uh, privatized mass transit. And do you think we're headed to that end game in the most pessimistic way that you laid it out? Um, What's well, your feeling about actually what that trajectory looks like for Airbnb too? Because you've written about well, it's going to be their different. end game as well. Well, I mean, the real thing, right, is it's different from municipality to municipality and state to state, which is something that, also that like, um, you know, sort of all of these companies are exploiting, right? Um, you know, uh, like whether it's sort of the uh, uh, laws uh, in New York or you know, in uh, in New York, for instance, like. You know, with Airbnb, one of the more interesting things is like most, uh, or at least the, like I would say, like half of Airbnbs in New York are illegal um, because uh, because of short-term rental laws in New York City, where if you any any apartment building with more than three units, you can't uh, rent it out for fewer than thirty days if you're not present. Um, so uh, I don't know it's it's you know, and, and uh, a lot of these companies now are using um, former uh, Obama administration people who are like very adept at like dealing with the government. So, um, you know, if I were to sort of place bets on the government versus these companies, I would probably put my money on the companies, no offense. I'd like to uh, dig into and, that and a little bit. And, and okay. as you respond a question to add to that, because I, I do want to give you a chance to respond, but also Lyft has a partnership with General Motors now, and I just want to ask about that change that pivot toward perhaps a partnership in actually um, making vehicles and how that begins to play out in terms of how the cities, the streets are shaped in the future and so on. But as part of your response, I just yeah. wanted to ask about that too. Well, so, I mean, I don't really actually work on the regulation of Lyft. I work on how Lyft intersects with public transit. That's what I do. I spend all my day running around the country talking to transit agencies. I've been with Lyft since you know we first launched four years ago, so I've had a lot of different hats. But What's cool right now is that a bunch of transit agencies want to talk to us because they're reimagining the way that they deliver mobility service in light of the entrance of this kind of technology. Because you know, here, here's the situation that transit agencies face, is that they have, they have a mandate to provide service throughout a jurisdiction. Um, they, they have a moral imperative to provide mobility service for people that live in their jurisdiction. But the land use patterns and the population densities in those areas vary enormously. And for too long, public transit has had, you know, basically the 40-foot bus and the train to deliver transit. And those aren't the right tools for every environment. And so what you see is an America in which the vast majority of people do not have access to um, realistically convenient public transit. Only a third of jobs in the United States are available, uh, reachable within 90 minutes traveling by public transit. And that's 90 minutes. I don't think anyone wants to spend three hours tra you know, in their commute every day. Um, but there are a lot of transit dependent populations that do that uh, because that's the mobility service that their community affords to them. And the reason for that is because, um, because the only tools that, that the public had to provide mobility service was a 40 foot bus, which if you operate it in a low-density area like most of the Los Angeles region in Southern California, you cannot fill up enough people on that bus to make it cost-effective to run service as frequently as would actually be meaningful for to give people mobility service. This is why everyone in, in Los Angeles owns a car. And I mean, I think that's, you really, you know, introduced this discussion by talking about a, a city that has been built around car ownership. And the reason for that is because, well, if you ripped out the transit lines. Right? Well, it was you first built around streetcars before um, that. Then it was right, built so around car I mean, ownership. The city, yeah. the city ripped out transit. And so that was the first mistake. And we're, we're fixing that. Measure R, measure R2, we're going to fix the fact that we ripped out transit. But it's still, it, still going to be fixed guideway transit that is not going to get to the front doors of a lot of people. And so you need, in this low-density environment, to have right-sized mobility options that can efficiently deliver service in a convenient amount of time to give people that economic mobility and to actually allow people to not have to own a car. Right. I think right. that that collaborative energy is really important. It does make more sense in a city like LA perhaps than another city that's denser or has a different kind of transit system. But I also think we have to be wary of projects that begin to, I mean, Hyperloop is an example. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of ways to analyze Hyperloop. One of the ways, I think, is to think about it as an attempt to poison the well for high-speed rail. And if you think about it that way, particularly in terms of public support, if you present something which seems frictionless, not just in its technology, but also in its <laughs> politics, right? <laughs> that it doesn't have to deal with all, it doesn't have to grapple with all the obstacles that high-speed rail is, is faced with. Yeah. And then to go back to your end game, the sense when, if there is an indication that these companies um, 
are moving actively against uh, public transit as a kind of utility, then it's a different conversation, right? But um, well, so and let me hear that. some last thoughts from all you guys, and then we'll we'll take a couple questions. But go ahead, Matt. I would say, well, I, I think it would be more. In, uh, I don't want to say insidious than that, but like I think it would be more gradual than that, right? You you have um, these companies working with public transits, uh, partly uh, for reasons of scale now, right? Um, and then you know, as sort of time goes on, you may have that sort of look differently. But you know, at the end of the day, like Uber and Lyft want to make money, which is you know that's that's the end game. As does Elon Musk. So yeah. Um, I think that all these conversations tend to hover around the idea that human needs uh, take a back seat to technological and business needs. Like, let's arrange everything so that it's easy for this company or this government institution, you know, and forget about what actually suits the people that live in a place. And I think like any institution, any business, any agency, as long as it comes first and says like we want to put the needs of the people who live here first, we'll succeed whether it's profit making or not. But that's got to be and explicit. What, and so that's a great point, Marie. What should, what should cities, neighborhoods be asking for specifically if it's not a benchmark about, about car sharing and carpooling? I mean, what are the specific things you think we should be We should be asking and not telling, companies? right? Yeah. They should yeah. be asking. Like, you know, have community have like Tafari come in and say like what do the people need who live in the place where you and he'll tell them and that becomes like not just a cute little thing to have at one meeting it becomes a leader of decision making that's that we so, don't have that's that. so easier said than done then I mean I'm well, thinking about the 5M project in San Francisco there were like 25 different sure groups represent, I mean, to the it's idea that you can go to a community meeting and say, what do the people want? They're, the people all want different things. Of course so they it's, do. So it's a lot more challenging than well, that. I oh, think. you know, I, I mean, it seems like the, well, politics forever. It's it just ugly seems, as hell. And it just seems like democracy is challenging. I mean, I think the, 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 the idea <laughs> that, yeah. the idea that, it, you know, I, point taken, you're right, it is challenging. I've been in so many of those community meetings and have seen, you know, community stakeholders even, you know, get, get at each other in, in ways where they're fighting over what they want on their same block in front of their same houses. So, of course, these things are messy, but I do think of still having, you know, in the idea of what it means to make and create an inclusive city, to go back to that, that term for me, those messy processes are what are part of the human condition, right? It's part Yay. of the Absolutely. Corporate but, but it always, as always with a political conversation, it gets back to leverage. And one of the things we talked about last week is that in San Francisco, because it's so congested in such a dense and small city, that these companies really want to have places where they can think about drop off and pick up. And, and that's a, a really contested set of spaces in the city. That, and it's not quite the same. Maybe it'll, we're getting there in Los Angeles, but. Um, it's not the, the the points of leverage are, are different, of course, in every. Yeah, but, but every there's city. value to that infrastructure, and I think that's something Absolutely. that you know this understanding of user experience and understanding of data helps us to understand and tune in more real time, kind of how those resources are kind of aligned to need. And I think, you know, democracy is messy, absolutely. And I think what technology does is it opens up for those who have access to it a, a, a new feedback loop to City Hall in a way that never existed before. There was no such thing as a 311 app where you could report a pothole or a busted, you know, sidewalk uh, on your, your smartphone when you were walking to wherever you were walking to. These tools are creating new entryways into City Hall at a level that suddenly disrupts the way that we operate internally. So all of a sudden solving problems requires, you know, much more collaborative thinking, breaking down silos internally. It's forcing a new behavior within City Hall. And it is extremely disruptive, which means that it's messy and it's going to take a long time and it takes advocates being there to make sure that we stay on course. And that is something that I think is really exciting about what's happening in Los Angeles is that we have to do it, we have to do it for hundreds of different communities and very different neighborhoods and with very different topographies and different needs and different challenges and languages and it's 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 completely insane in terms of the scale and trying to get your head around it but it's absolutely gorgeous because this is the way if we can solve it here I think we can replicate the model anywhere else. Well, I think country. there are also particular governance challenges to the fragmentation, different jurisdictions that are particularly acute in, in, in Southern California. So let me open it up to a couple of uh, questions before we wrap it up. Yes, right here in the front.
Right. So it's sort of it's, it's so I, yeah. I, I Right, hyperloop. So it gets to the question we were asking before: how do how do you weigh that, particularly when there's about to be a ballot measure, and and how do you make that case when there are perhaps other technologies or services waiting well, in the wings? I think right? I'd like to make maybe an unexpected point, which is you know that I think like Lyft is extremely supportive of and thinks that's very helpful for there to be robust investment in public transit infrastructure because right now you know most people drive like there's massive public subsidy of driving and private car ownership. Mm -hmm in the form of free parking, in the form of, you know, the affordances of our infrastructure that make it, you know, that really easy uh, and cheap for people to own cars. And I think that, you know, Lyft will not be successful in an environment in which people continue to own cars. Our, you know, the, the growth trajectory for Lyft is one in which people um, get out of car ownership and start becoming multimodal transportation consumers. And, you know, mass transit is a critical part of that ecosystem. It's, it's going to be the most affordable part of that ecosystem. It's the one that's, you know, that really people will depend on for their daily commutes and then, and then once they you know feel that they have access to a robust enough transit network then they're going to be someone that uses Lyft frequently if they don't have that and they don't have the enough, the enough transit that's available to them to make that tipping point or enough car sharing and bike sharing this sort of uh, ecosystem of options they're just going to continue driving anywhere and that's not any good for Lyft so I you know other thought I th very quickly very quickly So no, I think I, we've reported that. So I think there no, it's are a good question. Actually, um, actually, about twenty percent of rides in this market start or end uh, within a couple hundred meters of a, a transit agency or a transit station. It's hard, of course, to know exactly what that person's doing, right? So I would say take it with a grain of salt. Like that's what we can tell from our data of where rides are starting and ending. And some of those, you know, could be downtown where we have no clue what that person's actually doing. Others of them, though, if they're starting at, um, you know, a a suburban kind of a rail station, a place with a larger footprint, we can make a pretty good guess. And we know that a Union Station is actually our single most popular, oh, sorry, second to LAX, second most popular <laughs> uh, pickup and drop off location in the entire city. So I think this, there's a lot to be said for the kind of the overlap in the community of people that are using transit and are using Lyft and using them increasingly in combination. I think we're going to see that a lot. I mean, not not to, to put the equity questions aside, which and, and we always have to remember there are people for whom Uber and Lyft is really not an option on a day-to-day -day basis, but I think we're going to see more of that with the Expo line. I think the fact that the Expo line will take us all the way to Santa Monica but leave huge north-south gaps are, is going to mean that bike share, new kinds of pedestrian amenities, and car share are all going to be um, a, a, a crucial part of that mix. Another question. Yes. Well, I, I can't speak specifically to what the types of data. It's, it is all map data, which is something that a lot of GIS data has typically been locked up or available at a fee from cities, and now a lot of that information is now readily available. And I think the open data movement is kind of also a very early stages when we think about kind of it's one thing to put data out there, it's one thing to put useful data out there, and it's another thing to put it out in a format that's consumable. And there's, so we're kind of inching away, and I think the GeoHub that was launched uh, about a month or so ago is a good kind of next step in trying to make that data more useful by putting it in a format that's consumable for, for people who are comfortable in working with maps. But not everyone works map with maps very well, so you, you know, you have to, it, there's a, there are trade-offs, but I think if we're going from this kind of trying to untap the data at all costs, no matter what, let's get it out there so it's open, to now let's provide it in a format that's actually consumable that people can use and it can be relevant and maybe we'll start to s instill more insight from it, which I think distill more insight from it, which is very exciting. If there's one more really brief burning question, I'll take it and then we'll wrap up. Yes. Very good question. Can I, can I take this one? Because I think that I can apply something that we're working on in the Bay Area 
to Los Angeles. Uh, Spur issued a report earlier this year called Seamless Transit, which had about 60 recommendations for uh, transit fixes. And transit people are really loving this report because there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. For example, the fact that there is no regional transit map. And I would, <coughs> you have a separate map for each part of the Bay Area, so it actually takes True down an, here too, right? an, an, yeah, an arduous amount of work to plan any kind of journey outside your normal thing. Why? Why is that so? <laughs> so we've been funded to actually develop a regional transit map. I have tried to, um, I want to come to LA and do the whole transit experience and I think that the city has a ways to come on legibility and, and, and a map that would kind of help someone navigate that because I would love to go to just many, many cities and be able to do that and I think that a great paper map can sometimes be the best thing and I think that that's kind of getting lost a bit in all of this. Having the giant map that's up in stations and on streets and, and having really good wayfinding is essential and I hope that, that people are still paying enough attention to that. I had a great experience a few years ago. I went to a smart city conference in Barcelona and my cell phone didn't work. And the whole program of the conference was a downloadable app and, and I couldn't figure out how to get anywhere with technology. So I was like, I've been here before in college with a backpack and a paper map and that's what I'm gonna do. And you know what, it's really important to know how to do that. And so I feel like we need to balance the, um, it was, one, it's an equity issue because not everybody has a smartphone and I think a lot of people are aghast or surprised to learn that still. Um, but I want to be able to see in front of me a physical manifestation of that transportation and I think that something, not that it's easy, but something as basic as that could be really transformative for just about any city. You mean for, for users of transit who don't have smartphones in particular, who also are not driving? Right, what kind of message is it sending if you have to have a credit card right to do yeah. bike share? Uh, well, we talked about this earlier today. I, I have a lot of ideas about this. I know there's only a little bit of time, but you know, there, there's so many different ways. Once you're in the world of APIs, where different services can be and made API, available. And API means? Application programming interface, which is basically the way different apps connect to each other. So it means that you know, instead of requesting a Lyft through the Lyft app, um, you know, there could be like a kiosk on the side of the road where you could like on a digital screen like punch in your unique ID and then dispatch a Lyft vehicle to come get you, then tie back to your account. I mean, I think about that a lot, and, and not just for people that don't have smartphones. Sometimes my smartphone dies, That's right. you know, and I don't and have a phone charger, and yeah. then I'm yeah. stranded, right? <laughs> so I think there is an opportunity to think about dispatch through without devices or uh, without, you know, at least like something you have to carry with you that could be like just something just a human could interact with. Uh, but that's kind of a, a new area. And, and we are, we are looking at, I mean, there's real-time arrival uh, uh, signage that's been put up at some of our uh, pilot uh, bus shelters. Kiosks are being considered by Metro to help people navigate. You can go to a kiosk and, at LAX and get access to the Go LA app, which would help you navigate and you can pick your choice, you know, whether you want the fastest, cheapest, or greenest route. Um, so there's definitely trying to create kind of uh, interfaces on the, in the public right of way and at key nodes across the city. I mean, that's the biggest challenge we have, right? Is we've got many different <coughs> nodes, so it's not a centralized place. It's not like you're going into a downtown and it's the only central business district. So certainly trying to be kind of sensitive to that. Text base is also another tool that's available as well. And so a lot of people that don't have data plans but might have text messaging, there's a lot of tools that might be available to that as well where you can text and find the real-time arrival information through a text message. Um, you know, just, I think just the straight analog stuff, you know, bike share is coming online in Los Angeles. I got the opportunity to test drive some of those bikes and they're, they're really nice. Um, and they're talking about integration of payment systems so that, you know, folks with, you know, uh, different kinds of payments, you know, even from like electronic benefit transfer kind of stuff yes. would might be able to factor into being able to pay for those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I don't know, for me, I, I still, I'm, a, I don't know, I'm the only person who still gives zero fucks about automated tr cars. I don't, I don't know, I'm not even thinking about that, ever mm -hmm. getting one of those ever in my life. And I don't know, you know, I just, it's finding so much conversation about it where I think a lot of folks, it's just not even on their radar about mobility. So. 
I mean, a lot of, a lot of working class folks are riding their bikes up and down the streets of Los Angeles right now mm -hmm. and have no public right of way really to speak of in terms of being safe in those spaces. So, you know, programs like Vision Zero are critically important in terms of looking at safe spaces for where people are right now um, and where they may be for the foreseeable future and where we want to keep them on some levels, like we don't want them necessarily to leave those bikes. Um, we want to make those bikes a dignified transportation mode so that folks feel re respected and safe in their, in their public space, so that we have eyes on the street, so that we have life in our streets, so that I can have a pleasant walk and my grandmas and my little baby, baby kids in the neighborhoods can be in their, on their street and feel safe on their street corner, not yeah, with, with in cars, particularly there's a, driverless there's a ones. There's desire. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a huge desire to live like that. Yeah. Like, you know, I always think about this particular question of Luke Skywalker turning off the computer so that he can feel his way, you know, to like, I think like that's how people want to be. And also, yeah, and I think th it's a really nice place to end to Fari's point about, you know, as we think about uh, these futuristic visions, let's not forget about fighting the battles that are right in front of us as well. And I think that's a, a good lesson to keep in mind. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Please join me in thanking the panelists. And thanks t again to my students for a really terrific semester, and thanks for all the uh, help that we've gotten over the course of the semester from Oxy and putting these uh, panels together. Thanks so much. <laughs>